So it's that time of year again where students across college campuses are getting together for the much anticipated informative speech. So there you are getting ready to do your informative speech and you got to get through like 20 speeches before it's your turn. So you're sitting there and you get a couple speeches on the iPhone and you get a speech or two about some topic that clearly came from another project. And then someone stands up and says, that they are going to give their speech on Cardi B. And you think, oh, this is cool. This is totally going to be a good speech. And so they start. Cardi B was born, blah, 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 member of the Bloods, blah, 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 musical theater and technology, blah, 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 age of 19, blah, 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 supermarket, strip club, blah, 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 escape poverty, blah, blah, blah. And it it's interesting in the sense that, like, there's a lot of stuff in here that's cool. But unfortunately, none of that stuff has been turned into anything substantial. This hypothetical student has committed the classic, um, what I call the Wikipedia problem, which manages to turn even the most interesting material into something that is overwhelming and boring because people can only pay attention to so much. So the Wikipedia problem is that it's lists and lists and lists of information, but I do not know what to do with it. Hence, my face looks very much like this cat which has given informative speeches a reputation as being the worst. Now, people always want to hear them, they want to give them. Most of the speeches that we give in the current historical era are informative, but rarely does anyone ever sit through an informative speech and feel really, really excited or engaged. That's because informative speeches, at least as we tend to practice them, presume an ideal rational subject that does not exist, i.e. this guy. We'll see him again later. So rather than giving an informative speech for a bunch of people that are not actually in the audience, even though that's easier, let's talk about strategies for giving an informative speech for actual people that are sitting in your audience. And interestingly enough, as we'll learn over the next few minutes, the secret to giving a great informative speech is actually not to inform anyone. Now, that may seem like a strange thing to say, given the title of an informative speech is, in fact, the word informative, but we'll see that that's a skewed perspective, and we'll understand that after we look at the classical three genres of rhetoric, the four research questions you can ask when trying to formulate an informative speech, and the organizational patterns available to you when you finally put that speech into practice meant for an audience. Traditionally, in rhetorical theory, and we're talking ages old, there were three types of speeches. This was it, just the three. There was the forensic speech, the deliberative speech, and the epideictic. It's important to notice that in the three types, there's no informative speech. And that's sort of the question we're going to be answering in this first part of the presentation, which is, where does the informative speech fit if for years and centuries and decades it wasn't part of the, part of the canon? And what I'll suggest is that ultimately the informative speech is a modern speech genre that has evolved, that really is just a different mode of doing any of these three, the forensic, the deliberative, or the epideictic. But first, let's go over the three types. The forensic speech dealt with questions of fact. These are the kinds of things where you sit in front of a jury, like in the O.J. Simpson case, and you try to figure out if the glove does or does not fit. So when we say like forensics or DNA, those are people who go to the crime scene and try to collect evidence about whether or not certain things actually happened. They don't pass judgment. They don't deal with the law. They don't interpret things. They just look to see if the evidence is there. Forensic speeches deal with questions of fact, and they're typically past-oriented, right? Did something happen? Did something cause something else? Theoretically, the way that I explain these are that if you were an omnipotent scientist, you could, in theory, settle a forensic debate. So for example, were there two shooters at JFK's assassination is a forensic question. The problem is that somebody knows somewhere. I mean, somebody knows the answer to that question. It's just not us. So questions of fact could be settled if we had access to all the information in the world, but because we don't, we have to speculate and use rhetoric and argument in order to settle those questions. Now, deliberative speeches are more what we think of when we think of rhetorical speeches, right? They are questions about policy and definition, and they're often future-oriented. They take place um, usually on Senate floors or the floor of the House where people decide what kinds of policy or what kinds of rules should be enacted. So deliberative questions are things like what should be done about X or under whose jurisdiction does this fall? So a lot of what we have to deliberate when we try to create policy are questions of what belongs or does not belong to another category. So for example, 
when we try to decide about refugee law or immigration law, the first thing we have to ask is like, which nation do people belong to? And are citizens citizens of the world or citizens of the nation? So even though um, policy and definition are different questions, they often work hand in hand because you can't have one without the other. And you'll notice too that forensic questions come into play during deliberative speeches because you have to settle certain forensic facts before you can deliver certain rules. So I'm not saying that these don't run together in certain arenas, but just that as a novice public speaker, it's helpful to think of them as different modes. Now, epideictic speeches are tricky. Um, strictly speaking, there are certain types of speeches that are epideictic. They are speeches about different types of values, right? So which is more important or which value should we stand for? They tend to be very present oriented and they are things you might see like at a funeral where when someone passes away, someone will stand up and give a speech that says what we should take from the memory of the dead or what lessons we should learn from those who have passed, which is really not about the person who died, which would be past oriented. It's about the people who have remained living and how they should live their lives starting right now because of what has happened. Motivational speeches are typically very epideictic, right? Because it's like, oh, I had this thing happen to me. It was really bad. Now I live every day, you know, like it's my last. You should do that too. So they are value-oriented, present-oriented speeches for audiences. Now, the interesting thing about epideictic is that they're not like they're not like questions of fact, where theoretically they could be settled, right? There's no person on earth, a living, dead, omnipotent or not, who could settle these issues. They are things that we debate over and over and over again. And at different times in history, different values are more prevalent than other values. So, for example, many years ago, before domestic violence was a thing back when, you know, it, sex between a man and a woman if they were married, and it was only men and women back then, unfortunately, it would just happened, right? There wasn't any rules. Now today, obviously, you cannot rape or sexually assault your domestic partner or your married partner, but 30 years ago, that wasn't considered a problem. But it's only through debates about value and the property of people's bodies and what makes for love and what makes for commitment and passion and what kinds of values as a society do we want to promote that these changes come about because in an era when there was no such thing as marital rape, the value was not society. The value was conformity to norms, right? It wasn't individual emancipation. It was like, be obedient, obey the rules, don't cause trouble. Years later, as we see that start to shift, it's because we're, that we're favoring different values in society and epideictic speech is one of the ways that these things happen because epideictics are precursors to things like policy. People are always speaking out against values and injustices before any policymaker is coming in to make changes. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the previous three genres is that nowhere do we see the informative speech. And more importantly, all three genres are persuasive. So if you're listening to an epideictic funeral speech, you may not necessarily think of it as persuasive. You may not even know you're being persuaded. But somewhere, someone speaking is trying to tell you that a certain value or a certain behavior is more important or better for society or for you, the individual, than another. So while not all persuasion is explicit, historically, there hasn't been such a thing as a speech that doesn't operate according to persuasion. That's because the ancients understood that people don't respond to things that aren't persuasive because nobody knows what to do with information unless there's a purpose for understanding the information. The information age is a relatively recent invention. So certainly, if you go to work and recently, um, I don't know, there have been some safety issues, right? So you've been getting written up, you've been getting citations, and you gather a bunch of people together to explain to them the new safety procedures. That's technically an informative speech, right? You're informing them about a series of, of, of safety procedures. But there's a persuasive element to it, which is, hey, we need to make sure that we keep safety up and running because if not, we're all going to lose our jobs and the company's going to go under and a bunch of other things. So whenever someone pays attention to information, it's usually because it has a purpose for them, which is what we're calling persuasion. Now, some persuasion is explicit, like you should do this or I want you to do this, and some persuasion is soft persuasion, where we just sort of make something seem attractive to somebody and that's why they would go and do it. Now, I don't consider, so if I'm like looking at a really delicious meal and even though I'm not super hungry, the, you know, my mouth is watering and there's a smell wafting in, I don't think of that as persuasion, but it is in a sense that it's something is being made attractive to me and that's making me want it. So it's sort of a similar principle with rhetoric. So the way we want to think about informative speaking, because how you think about the informative speech shapes your entire approach to it, 
is that informative speaking is always going to be persuasive, but it's going to be persuasive through the back door. Because if it's not persuasive, it's not interesting. But if it's explicitly persuasive, it violates the expectations. So when you write an informative speech, do not tell audiences what to do, what is valuable, or what is true, right? What to do is deliberative, what is valuable is epideictic, and what is true is forensic. Don't explicitly state that, but rather implicitly show audiences what to do, what is valuable, or what is true. But do it in an informative mode where you're acting as if you're not doing it and you never do it explicitly. So to put that in other terms, which will also serve as our thesis for the day, informing is not a type of speech, as in it's not a distinct genre from the other three. Informing is a modern mode for adapting the classic genres to an audience that imagines itself as rational. Once again, this person. And you can understand that if you think of um, different TED Talks that you've seen. So TED Talks are, by, by, by far and away, they are m pr primarily informative speeches. Sometimes you'll hear a call to action, or sometimes there will be an explicit agenda, like we need to teach cultural literacy, uh, literacy in uh, the schools. But they're always like things that nobody's really going to debate, right? You don't really get a lot of TED Talks that are arguing like deeply in favor of policy change or handgun control or uh, you know, pregnancy termination, you mostly get informative speeches that usually have some type of small call to action. But if you watch TED Talks, you can tell the difference between a speech that's just informative, they set out to inform, and a speech that has some type of agenda, be it epideictic, deliberative, or forensic. Now, not everyone does this well, but generally speaking, a great TED Talk that's really engaging to watch and also does its job is going to be one that you can sense that there's something else going on or there's a bigger picture, but the speech never explicitly asks you to make a decision or gives you a call to action. Rather, all of the information that's being presented is pointing in one general direction, but again, it never quite goes in that direction. But that's really the general idea of a really good informative speech is something like that, and lots of TED Talks. And so that brings us to the question of how do you do this? Because obviously it's a lot easier to open a Wikipedia article, write down a bunch of facts about Cardi B, read those facts to an audience, um, at least in the preliminary phases. But one of the things you'll find is that the more and more that you adopt informative speaking as more of a mode and less of like the only thing you're supposed to do, you'll find that delivery gets to be much easier because it's very hard to deliver a list of facts to the audience. It's hard to know where you are, where your place is in the speech to try to remember things. It's also boring for the audience. So when you're thinking about putting together your speech, instead of thinking about gathering information on a topic, think about one of the four research questions that can help guide your topic. If you do a search for types of informative speeches, you get a pretty standard list. This is just a generic slide from the internet that I found. And you usually get a list of somewhere between like four and six types of speeches. And they all typically fall under similar categories, right? Demonstration, instruction, how to do stuff, description, um, explanation, how do things work. And then there's a variety of others typically that come from specific business contacts, so briefings, reportings, things like that. Obviously, we're not going to care too much about that. But it's good to know that when you do a general Google search of types of informative speeches, you tend to get the same set of options. Now, I'm not going to get into uh, briefings. I'm sure that they're important, but I can't imagine a world in which you would want to do a briefing as an informative speech in the way that we typically do them in public speech in classes. Um, so if we look at the first two, demonstration and instruction, they both are supposed to either show listeners how to, con how to do something or they're supposed to teach listeners how to do something. Now, I don't really draw a distinction from that because, in my opinion, you should always be teaching your audience to do something because... If you stand up there and go through a series of steps as if the audience is writing stuff down, you're already going to lose because your audience is not writing stuff down. So generally speaking, I combine demonstration and instruction. Description and explanation are both fine. Those are pretty standard types of speeches. And then the last one we have is this reporting speech. If done well, reporting speeches can be great. The problem is that the word reporting sounds very informative to me, right? It sounds like I'm going to stand up and give a report which is a bunch of facts about something. So if you think about like the book reports you used to do in grade school, they're just like you standing up, who's the character, what was the conflict, blah, 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 blah. But what we're supposed to get out of it, um, we don't know, right? It's, it's not a literary analysis. It's just literally a report of things that were in the book. So reporting, we're going to take kind of a different spin on because as it stands, reporting is not really an exciting, informative genre. 
So we're going to rethink of the four speeches this way. We're going to keep demonstration slash instruction, right? What are sometimes called the speech to teach. But in these, instead of just giving a bunch of steps to do something, which only works if someone's like right next to you also working on an engine, we talk about what's the secret to doing something. So what's the method to the madness or what's the secret to the strategy? Because in the end of the day, if you're trying to teach an audience how to change out an engine, they're not going to remember everything to do. They're going to have to go home and YouTube it. So it would be stupid to act that way. Instead, you want to have some secret or some specific approach to why it works for you that they can then go ahead and take with them. I mean, and this is ultimately why we still have speech. If a wicked, if I could just watch a YouTube video how to change an engine, then that's all I would do. The reason we keep speech around is because speakers are supposed to add some kind of insight or depth to the topic that just a general broad search on the internet can't give us. And so while you may find that on YouTube, um, it's more often that you get a series of steps. And so the thing that sets apart a really great speaker is the ability to add some kind of secret element or special, special edge to the topic rather than just the series of steps. Then we have a description speech. Uh, description speeches are what's it like to do something. So they are expository. They are supposed to put you in the shoes of an experience or a person. These are hard to write, but generally speaking, a descriptive speech pretty much works the same way for everybody. Then there are these explanation speeches. These are theory speeches, right? They explain how something works or why something works. They're not process speeches. So if you want to explain how whiskey is made, you don't give 16 steps to make whiskey. That would be a demonstration or instruction speech. You talk about the process behind it, specifically what is it that makes it happen. And then finally, what we were previously calling the reporting speech, we're now going to call the controversy or the stakes speech, which is essentially why are we arguing about this. So rather than reporting on the different things that are happening or the facts of the situation or who did what to whom, you're sort of like a cultural critic here, right? You're trying to understand why this particular controversy is going on and what it says about the culture that we're in. So if we want to look at the four research questions you've got at your disposal, you have these four. Now I've put them in order of the way that they work the best. So typically for most people, especially novice public speakers, your theory speech is going to be by far and away the best one. So the theory speech is what makes something work or how does something work. That's going to be your best option nine times out of ten to start with. Then we have these demonstrative or speech to teach. These are the how-to speeches, right? What's the secret to doing something? This is going to be your second best bet in most cases. Although again, um, if you stand up there and just give people a list of 26 steps to do something, you're going to fail. Expository or descriptive, these are typically very hard to write because you really have to be an incredibly descriptive, in-depth writer. But if you're doing speeches about particular experiences, whether it's like how a certain person lives their lives or a biography or a trip or a, a place in the world, then descriptive probably is going to be your best bet, but again, requires a really a tremendous amount of writing talent. Finally, we have what I call the wild card. Um, these are the controversy or stakes speeches. When done well, these are great. Um, I think that they are exactly what a public speaking speech should be, which is something insightful that tells us more about how we as a culture tick. But more often than not, they just turn into like a pro-con speech, and we don't really want that. So if you think you can pull it off or you have a topic that's really well suited to this type of speech for a question, then run with it. But generally speaking, they are pretty difficult, so I kind of put them as the wild card because it so depends on the different person and the topic that they're looking at. All right, so let's look at our first type of speech. Um, this is the what makes X tick speech, right? So this is the theory speech. And so like... What makes Harley Davidson so successful, right? So I picked a topic, motorcycles, I picked a subtopic, specifically the Harley Davidson brand, and I want to understand why they've been so successful. So I go ahead, I do some research, and one of the things I keep coming across is that they were one of the first people to, one of the first companies to implement this lifestyle marketing thing. So bam, I've got my answer. What's the secret to Harley Davidson's success? Well, the fact that they've created this lifestyle marketing program. All right, so let's look at the next type of speech, uh, the how-to speech. This is a classic. Again, it can be tricky if you just really want to give a, a series of steps, but if you have a secret approach to doing something that is a something the audience might be interested in knowing, absolutely this is the speech for you. So for me, I love to bake. I love to bake um, pies and things that have crust, quiche, and I have for a long time wondered what the secret to a great flaky pie crust is. So I did a bunch of research. And one of the things I came up with is um, the issue of keeping the butter cold. And so there's a whole science behind this that if I were actually going to give the speech, I would explain. And it has to do with preventing the formation of gluten because if you perform gluten, your, your uh, pastry gets really uh, chewy instead of that nice flaky pastry that we associate with things like croissants. 
But suffice it to say that as I did my research on the secret to making a great pie crust, I came across a lot of secrets. One of the secrets was, you know, the difference between, you know, all butter or shortening or should I do butter and shortening. So the more I read about it, though, the more I realized, well, that's not really important. What's important is to keep the butter from melting because then the water content of the butter mixes with the gluten, or mixes with the flour, which creates gluten. So what's the secret to a flaky pie crust is my research question, and my answer is the secret to baking a great pie crust is to keep the butter cold but pliable, which basically means you can't have rock-hard frozen butter because then you can't work with it, but you, you can't have melted soft butter either because then it'll form gluten, right? So the difference here is that rather than give people a bunch of steps about making a pie crust that they have to go right down, they now have a secret. So any pie crust recipe that they come across, they can adapt using this, this strategy. And so if they come across a pie crust recipe, for example, that says you're supposed to melt the butter and then mix it in with the dough, oh no, 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 that's absolutely unacceptable. So now they can take the recipe and they can adapt it, even though, again, I would still go on in this speech to sort of walk through the recipe, but I would never say things like a quarter cup of flour, half a cup of sugar, because again, your audience is not writing this stuff down. They don't need a recipe from you. What they need is an approach so that they can apply that to any recipe. And that's true whether you're doing a recipe speech or really any other how-to speech on earth. All right, so the descriptive speech. Um, this one's a tough one, you know, so I went with a question about what it's like to drive um, the new Ford Mustang. And I picked this because it's hard. And so there are so many ways you could make this bad, right? What's it like to drive the, drive the new Ford Mustang? Awesome. What's it like to drive a new Ford Mustang? fast, right? None of these really tell you anything. So this is part of the problem with the descriptive speech is that it's really hard to put into words what it feels like to experience certain things. And that's why the speech can be so difficult. So for me, again, same thing. I read a bunch of stuff about the Ford Mustang, read different reviews of it, read different accounts of people uh, driving it. And I came across an article where someone said, you don't turn corners in a Mustang, you strike them. And I loved that. So I actually borrowed it for the central idea for this speech. And of course, then later in the speech, I would, I would make sure I attribute the citation to the person from whom I borrowed it. But this is a good lesson, right? You're not, you don't ever have to come up with the central ideas for these speeches from scratch. You're always going to find them from somewhere. Just make sure that when you find them, you give proper credit to the person from whom you cite. All right, so now we're on to our last type of speech, the controversy speech, the stakes speech, right? Why are we arguing about it? not a report speech. So um, this is our replacement for what is commonly called the report speech. So let's talk about a really hot button issue right now, gun control, right? And specifically, I narrowed that down to the assault rifle ban because I feel like if you just try to look up gun control, it's way too much information. So it's always helpful to narrow down to a subtopic to help make things easier on yourself. So why are we arguing about the assault rifle ban? Like, why can we not just settle this thing? And then, you know, there's, of course, this big fact about, like, well, what's the Second Amendment? Well, that's actually not... Whether or not the Second Amendment, whether or not the Second Amendment does in fact support assault rifle bans is a question of definition. That's a different kind, right? That's not an informative speech. That would be a deliberative speech. So certainly there are speeches that you can give, but they would not really match the expectations of an informative speech because you're not supposed to tell the audience what to do or what to think. So certainly you could do a speech about the like, for example, the different ways that the Second Amendment has been interpreted throughout history. Because obviously the Second Amendment has not always been interpreted the same way. That's because that's how constitutional amendments work. But that's not the way that I chose to go with this. I instead chose to go with why we're arguing over the assault rifle ban. And as I listen to people debate this, and I listen to people talk, and I read the research, and I read the reviews, and I listen to the speeches on the Senate floor, the thing that I've come across from doing all this research is that when you're in favor of gun control, you think that the bad guy is everybody. Right? I'm the bad guy, you're the bad guy, my neighbor's the bad guy, my dad's the bad guy, because anybody could be mentally ill or have a breakdown or be irresponsible at any time. So let's take the guns away. On the other hand, if you support uh, free gun ownership and you want limited restrictions, you think the bad guy is somebody else, right? It's the minority, they're out there, they're not in the classroom, they're not in my family, they're the bad guys, and they're going to get a gun, and then the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. But the thing is, is like, we can't decide whether we're all good, like fundamentally humans are rational and good, or if we're all irrational and at any minute could snap. And so that's really the debate that's going on. And so it's, again, I'm not trying to solve the debate. It's not a deliberative speech. I'm saying that at the heart of this debate is this problem that we can't solve, which is whether or not humans are fundamentally rational or irrational. 
And what's cool about this is I've given an interesting spin on it now. It's more of a psychology um, rhetoric speech than it is a political speech. And now people who might be on edge because, oh God, I don't want to hear another speech about whether or not to ban assault rifles, can now see something else at work in the assault rifle ban debate that might make them more interested. And it certainly is going to make you seem like a very astute and engaged public speaker. All right, so we've just looked at the ways that the four informative research questions, when phrased um, in certain ways, can help you approach the issue of doing an informative speech that isn't just a gathering of facts. So now let's move on to the next piece, which is once you've gotten your research question and you've answered that and gotten a central idea, how do you then do the rest of the speech? Because for our, for our purposes, your informative speech is only going to be, you know, three, four, five, six minutes long. But in some cases, you might have an informative speech like a TED Talk that's 18 minutes long. But the answer is still the same regardless of whether it's a few minutes long or a really, really long speech, which is you create patterns to organize your main points. Now, if you're giving an informative speech that's pretty small, like you've got two minutes to give an informative speech on something, do not have main points. Just use the research questions, write your central idea, and then give a couple pieces of evidence, and then you're done. It's only if you have longer speeches, usually something upwards of five minutes, that you should create main points to build infrastructure, because if not, your audience is going to get lost. But rule of thumb, you don't need main points for speeches under two or three minutes, and you should always have main, main points for speeches over four or five minutes, because audiences typically will get lost, as will speakers, and they won't know where to go next. But as long as you know you have main point one, main point two, and main point three, you've got nice manageable sections of the speech. So let's talk about how the patterns can help you identify your main points. All right, so once again, much like the types of speech, if we do um, a Google search for organizational patterns, you're going to come up with something that looks like this. And some of them are very long. I chose this one because it's manageable and small. But some of them have like 15 patterns, and there's all kinds of crazy patterns. There's wave patterns and narrative patterns. And while I appreciate all of that, you are definitely not at a stage where you need more than a couple of patterns. So if we look at this slide, it has the four most common ones that are listed, right? There's a time pattern, a topical pattern, a space pattern, and a cause and effect pattern. So when we revise this, we are going to get rid of the topic pattern. Here's why. It's not a pattern, right? So if my main point is about making pie crust and then I have a topical pattern, what's going to happen is I'm going to have three new topics about pie crust. So in the end, what I'm going to have is four speeches smashed into one speech, not one speech that's, that's constructed through main points. So topical pattern is out because you already have a topic, right? Your topic is pie crust and how to make a great pie crust. You don't then need to add three topics on top of that. So never ever do a topical pattern. And I will tell you, if I ask you what organizational pattern are you using for this project and you write topical, I'm going to be really, really upset. So don't banish it from your vocabulary. It's no longer on the radar for you. Which leaves us with three. Um, time and space are great. You cannot go wrong with time and space because they're not their own topics. So you can take any main point and divvy it up to three different points in time, uh, beginning of the day, middle of the day, end of the day, World War I, World War II, Iraq War, 17th century, 18th century, and the present. Right? There's all kinds of ways you can do that. Um, the only real suggestion I have for the time is make sure it's parallel. So you don't want to do ancient Rome, World War II, and now because ancient Rome is you know, thousands of years old, and then World War II and now are only like 70 years apart. So just make sure that your time pattern sort of spaces out in a logical, um, symmetrical way. Same thing with your space slash your geographical. So those are different um, spaces, different places, different areas. They can be sort of different co contributing factors. So in the case of like plagiarism, if I were going to talk about plagiarism in the classroom, I might use the desk up front where the teacher stands, the door of the classroom, and the windows as three different main points to represent different ways that plagiarism affects, you know, education. So that's a spatial pattern because it's the layout of the room. It's a space-oriented pattern. It can also be different geographical spaces. It can be different spaces um, in the world. It can be different spaces on a battlefield. So you can be pretty creative with the different types of spaces. And then finally, we have cause and effect. And cause and effect covers a bunch of different things. But generally, I just call it the reasons. So, you know, when you're giving a speech and you're just like, oh, I have this central idea, here are a couple of reasons why that central idea is true. So um, if you want to say that that's topical, that's fine. I don't care because the reasons all point to the central idea. Now, don't get into the whole cause-effect solution piece 
because we're not going to do that, but just look at the cause and effect. You want to organize your speech by discussing a theme, so the theme of your central idea and its causes and effects. And so you can do two causes and one effect. You can do three causes and the effect is your central idea. You can do three effects of the central idea. You can do one effect and two causes. So you can split that up however you want. But generally speaking, the cause and effect is the only other pattern, I think, that works. Problem and solution, not so much. Pro con, not so much. So I would stick with these three, and certainly if you feel like you want to try another one, we can talk about it. But for the most part, I'm always just going to steer you back to these three because the other ones cause trouble, especially for the informative speech. But regardless of which of the patterns that you choose, time, space, or cause, effect, or reasons, you have to remember that you divide the theme of the speech, not the topic. So if I have a speech on pie crust, my main points are not three things about pie crust. Pie crust is the topic, but my central idea has the theme, and the theme for my pie crust speech is cold but pliable. So I'm going to have to figure out how to take the theme, cold but pliable, and either spread it out over time, spread it out over space, or spread it out over cause and effect or reasons. But the organizational pattern or main points of a speech always divide up the theme of the speech and not the topic. So if there is a theme in the central idea, right, and there always should be, this should be the thing you're adding to the speech. So you've got a topic on pie, right, but what's your take on pie? When I see that theme in the central idea, it should be in each of the main points because if it's not, then you've lost track of the theme and the speech has gone totally off the rails. This may make more sense if we look at the breakdown of where the organizational go, uh, pattern goes in your outline. So the organizational pattern is going to show up in two places in the outline. The first place that it's going to show up is in your preview statement over here on the left. So you're going to do your warm up, you're going to do your audience connection value statement where you introduce the theme, then you're going to do the central idea where you connect the theme to the topic, and then you're going to give a preview statement. Preview statements, again, are only in longer speeches. If you have a speech of under three or four minutes, you do not need a preview statement. If it's longer than that, you need a preview statement. The preview statement is the roadmap. It tells the audience where the speech is going. Do not omit it. It must be there. So the preview statement will lay out, it'll, first of all, it'll signal to the audience which pattern you're using. And they may not know the informative speaking patterns, but they'll inherently understand that you're creating a pattern for them to follow. Right? So then after you've said it, it also makes sure that they know which main points they're supposed to follow. So we're going to look at a few examples, but one thing you'll notice is that your preview statement is a preview statement of the three main points. So the first thing you say during your preview statement had better be main point one, and the second thing you say during your preview statement had better be main point two, and the third thing you say during your preview statement had better be main point three. If you say something in the preview statement third, it better not be main point one, right? It should follow a plan. So the way I explain this to people is, is if you think about a business agenda meeting. So I go into a meeting. It's going to be a 50-minute meeting. Somebody hands me an agenda. It says we're going to talk about item one, item two, item three. We'd better talk about that stuff in that order. It'd be super weird if we all of a sudden started with item six and then went back to item four, or if somebody started talking about things that weren't on the list, or if we talked about things that had nothing to do with things on the list. Because what someone has done is I've sat down for this 50-minute meeting, and they've done me a favor by giving me an outline hey, this, these are the things that we're going to talk about during the meeting. That's great. I appreciate that. It's super well organized. It lets me follow along. It lets me anticipate what's going to happen. It's even better if I get the agenda a couple days before and I get the chance to put something on the agenda. And there's a whole science behind how to run meetings. It's a whole major, you know, or, organizational management. You can do it if you want. That never been my thing. But the principle is the same. People like to feel organized, but they do not like to have the organization violated. If you're just going to stand up there and riff, just go off in random tangents, you're better off never giving a preview in the first place. So part of what the preview does is set up the expectations for the audience, but part of what it does is also discipline the speaker. Because once you've committed to that preview statement, you as a speaker know those are the three things you have to talk about in that order, and that's what you have to do because you've told the audience that's what you'll do. So returning to some of our previous slides, let's look at these again. So we have our type of speech. Right? What makes X tick? Why is Harley Davidson so successful? We have our central idea that Harley Davidson became so successful because they pioneered lifestyle marketing. And then we have our preview statement. So the preview statement should allude to the three main points that we're going to use during the speech as well as our pattern. So the post-World War II ethos and foreign competition that have been critical to Harley's lifestyle approach may be too cookie cutter for millennials. So we got three stopping points, right? We got post-World War II, we got foreign competition, and we got the issue of millennials, right, modern millennials. So this is obviously a cause-effect. So there were two causes 
that made the lifestyle marketing work, the post-World War II ethos, and the foreign competition. But now there is one effect of those things, which is after years and years of doing it this way, it's now not working for millennials and Harley Davidson is having some financial issues like they did back in the 80s. So there we go. We have a nice three cause effect pattern. It's clear to the audience. And you'll notice in this one, I've been able to avoid the, the dreaded, in this speech, I will discuss X, Y, Z, right? But it's okay to do that. It's totally fine if you want to stand up there and say, in this speech, I will discuss two reasons why Harley Davidson has been so successful with lifestyle marketing. First, their post-World War II ethos, and second, the foreign competition that they faced in the 80s. And then I will discuss one effect that has been negative for Harley Davidson more recently, and that is that its lifestyle approach may be too cookie-cutter for millennials. It's totally fine to lay it out very explicitly like that. Um, I don't, it, it's never bothered me. Some people think it's tacky, so if you don't like it, you can always make things a little smoother. So really quickly, let me talk about this Harley Davidson speech for a second. Um, the reason that I wrote this as a sample is because when I was in college as an undergraduate, you know, a decade ago, I was asked to do a project where I investigated a brand. And I had a partner, and I didn't know what brand I wanted to do. I did not like business marketing. And so I chose Harley Davidson for some reason, probably because somebody I was dating at the time had a Harley. And we did a bunch of research, and one of the things I came across was this lifestyle marketing component. So. I actually already knew the answer to this question before I wrote this particular sample. So this is a case where I sort of already knew the central idea that I wanted to talk about. And that happens sometimes, especially if it's a previous project or you happen to be an expert in it. But the thing is, is I didn't know where to take it from there. Like I knew this thing about lifestyle marketing, but I had no idea how that was holding up over millennials or what had happened. So I just did a really quick Google search, as you can see, for reasons for Harley Davidson's cultural success. And I was expecting to find some stuff about like World War II and the foreign competition in the 80s because I knew about that, but I was not expecting to find an article about how their reputation as like a rich old white guy brand was really off-putting to millennials who sort of perceived Harley's as this unnecessary excess and this very like corporatist consumerist attitude. So that was really cool to find. And again, what this illustrates is number one, when you do research, don't research the topic, research the theme. So first you have to do some reading before you figure out what the theme is. But once you know what the theme is, do your research primarily oriented around the theme. Because if not, you'll get a bunch of articles that are irrelevant. But the second thing is that even though you may be kind of an expert in your topic, uh, which can be helpful to the speech, and it's also one of the reasons why you would even start with the speech in the first place, your expertise alone is not enough. Right? You have got to draw on other sources or else you will inevitably only be at the tip of the iceberg and you won't have access to all of the information that would be available to you if you did your research and then use that research to show the audience that you've done your due diligence. All right, let's look at the second speech. What's the secret to flaky pie crust? We've got our central idea, we've got our theme, cold but pliable, so how are we gonna split this up? Well, in this case, um, I got this from an article that I was reading where it talked about the fact that you're often told to preheat your oven when you bake a pie but that's really bad because it makes your kitchen really warm. And in fact, keeping your kitchen cool is one of the secrets to making sure that your, your butter doesn't get too warm. So I decided to organize this as a spatial pattern by looking at three different areas of the kitchen that if you keep them nice and cool, it will help you make sure that your recipe never gets too warm. So first you need to optimize the temperature of your oven, right? which means basically keeping the oven off and cold until you're ready to cook the pie. Then you put the pie in the fridge and then you open the oven back up, you get the oven heated up, and then you take the pie out of the fridge. Then we look at the fridge. The fridge is really important. It's all about making sure you have enough fridge space before you start to cook, and that when you put the pie in the fridge, you use a timer because you never want it to be in the fridge too long. You never use the freezer. It makes the butter too cold. And finally, the counter, right, because the counter is the place typically where people spend too long working, and so you wind up with a pie crust that's too warm and therefore chewy. So different strategies for keeping the counter cool, different reasons why you do that, and also um, you know, minim minimizing the amount of time that you're working with the dough and using the fridge to alternate in between working with the dough and putting the dough in the fridge. So three areas, oven, fridge, counter. You could have done this as a temporal sequence, right? Time. The first part, you know, you're five minutes into the process, another 15, you could have done it that way. You probably could also do the reasons or cause effect but I was inspired by this piece of research that I did to use a spatial organizational pattern. I also just generally, overall, like spatial patterns the best, so I'm always drawn to them. All right, so what's it like to drive the Ford Mustang? This is our descriptive speech. We have a central idea. You don't strike, you don't turn corners in a Mustang, you strike them. So we have this idea of striking corners. 
So again, we have a three reason speech. So what are the three reasons that account for why the Ford Mustang handles so sharply? Well, we have its newest driving modes, normal, traffic, um, sport, and track. So we have three driving modes. It's the three driving modes that allow the sharpness for the vehicle, and that gives us a nice, clean, different way to explain the Mustang. And notice that by adding the sharpness theme, it's a hell of a lot more interesting than just, I'm going to give a speech on the new modes that come on the Ford Mustang, because that would be really boring. But adding this like sharp striking um, is really helpful. The only problem here is you would have to keep the focus on that descriptive piece, right? What's it like to drive the Mustang? Not just a bunch of information about the different sports and modes, because that would be very boring. So again, there's a reason why this is the most difficult speech. It's very, very hard to do. All right, and finally we have the NRA speech with the assault rifle ban. Um, we can't decide who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, and so I've divvied up the theme according to three different players in the debate, right? And I never say like pro-con other because that would be stupid. So that's why I don't give pro-con speeches because the problem with pro-con speeches is that usually there's one pro and one con and then like what do you do for the third main point? So I never do those. Um, but in terms of the, the different players in the group, we have the NRA for whom bad guys are the, the enemies for the anti-gunners, for whom bad guys are friends, and then there are a lot of corporations like Delta that um, are trying to seek a middle ground that doesn't exist. And so I would go over each of those three as different pieces of this puzzle about why we can't stop arguing over the assault rifle ban. Like, why haven't we just reached an agreement yet? And I've avoided that pro-con problem. So again, this is sort of a spatial pattern because there are three different people involved in the debate. It's sort of a reasons pattern because they are three different um, contributors to the controversy. So I'm not sure exactly what I would label this. It's probably a mix. But the important thing is that it's got three different pieces. They're all related, but they're distinct enough that the main points won't run into each other. And most importantly, they stay on the theme, right? Not just the topic, but the theme. All right, and that's pretty much it. So now if we were going to go ahead and return to that person who did the Cardi B speech, we would be armed with a bunch of strategies that we could use to take a lot of facts and a lot of data about Cardi B's life and turn it into something engaging. So let's do a quick recap of the kinds of questions that you would want to ask and the process you would go through as you were turning this list of information into a robust, interesting, informative speech. All right, and so here you have a nice long list about, you know, your topic and your subtopic. Then you got to read because you have to figure out which of the four research questions tend to be the best fit. And sometimes you just know. Sometimes you have to spend a little time with your topic. Then you keep reading because you have to find an answer to your research question. This is a big part of it. That's why you have to settle on your topic early because it takes some time to figure out what the answer to your research question will be. Then you keep reading because you got to find a pattern. So sometimes the pattern just speaks to you, right? So, for example, if you're doing a speech about someone's life, you just want to do a time pattern, right? Because that makes sense because every time people do speeches about people, they do time. Yeah, maybe, but what if you want to stand out, right? Or what if you want to take a different approach? It might make more sense, for example, instead of looking at Cardi B's timeline, to look at the different spaces that have influenced Cardi growing up, right? The urban space, the musical space, different places where she went that represent different tensions in her life and different competing impulses. You could look at the music conservatory her neighborhood and the strip club. I mean, you could do a lot of interesting stuff with space there. And then, of course, you could look at the three reasons, but of course, first we'd have to know what your theme is. All right, then you want to keep on reading, and you have to have at least three main points, because if you don't have three, you don't have a pattern, you just have a line. So you have to have three, and I, for speeches that are about six minutes, I wouldn't say more than three is really necessary, but I guess you could do four if for some reason you wanted to. But in most cases, people always stretch themselves too thin. If it's a nine-minute speech, you maybe want to go up to four or five main points. And then once you have all those things in place, you're ready to write a draft. And now you go back to the research you've done and try to find your supports, right? Find testimony, find stories, find an analogy maybe you came across or invent one. Um, so there's a bunch of things that you're going to find from the, the research that you've already done. Continue to research until you finish the supports that you need, two to three for each main point. Add your introduction and conclusion, and then just you got to do it a couple times, right? Because inevitably you'll have missed stuff, or things won't make sense, or you'll be off topic, or one main point won't fit with the other main point. So you got to read it out loud, get feedback, and repeat that process. But this overall is your general list of how to write the informative speech from the point at which you identify the topic to the point at which you're practicing. Also, in terms of research, there are just some general guidelines which students hate to hear because it's a lot, it takes a lot of research to get a decent informative speech, but that's just the way the world works because if you're not interesting, no one cares. 
And the only way you can be interesting is to be well read. It's just how it goes. So typically you want to say one citation per minute. So if you've got a four minute speech, you want to have four citations in there, maybe five just to sweeten the pot. Definitely not less than one per minute. Probably not much more than one every 45 seconds. You need to research at least three times the citations you cite. So if you've got a four minute speech, that means you are going to ultimately cite four citations, maybe five. You need to read three times that many because a lot of the stuff you're going to read is crap. Or a lot of it will have a great theme, but that isn't ultimately the one you wind up using, and so all of that becomes useless. And honestly, the three, three times is just some number someone came up with somewhere that's a good starting point. I mean, I can't even count. I bet you I read 20 times the citations that I cite when I write. Um, but, you know, this is sort of the minimum that you would need to do to be effective. It's definitely not what it would be required of you to be an expert. You need to mix your peer and your scholarly sources. So things like blogs or things like the Huffington Post, right, with, with scholarly peer-reviewed studies published. And then there's, of course, a bunch of stuff in the middle, like, you know, what's Oprah, what's Dr. Phil. For me, they're peer or popular, but, um, you know, somebody with a, a doctor who publishes a book might be considered scholarly to you. Kind of depends on your perceptive, but generally try to mix a lot of high and low sources, you know. A, somebody who wrote something insightful in a YouTube comment is totally valid as long as you have something a little more official to balance it out. Don't cite crap or filler ever. Don't cite Wikipedia. Don't cite useless facts. Don't cite random quotes from websites. I mean, you know this. I, it just, it's very infuriating because it really feels like you're condescending to the audience. It feels like you don't think that they're worth your time. Um, it feels like you picked a project you don't even care about. So really the worst thing you can do is cite crap research. I mean, at that point, you're probably better off citing no research because honestly, I'm just not going to give you credit for it. The audience will neither. And then finally, you have to have oral citations. So every time you cite something that's not your own words or your own idea, you have to tell people where it came from. And you can't just say, according to Jen Shoemaker, because who the hell is that, right? You have to say who Jen Shoemaker is, where you found their stuff, right? Maybe Jen Shoemaker has been... Uh, maybe she runs the Fit Mommy blog that's been blogging about motherhood and exercise for the last six years. Maybe she's an award-winning baker who was interviewed on um, the British Baking Show. I don't know. It's, it's fine that she's not a doctor or some fancy pants scholar. You just have to explain why I give a crap about Jen Shoemaker and what Jen Shoemaker has to say. And this is also a good test for the previous one, which is like if you're embarrassed to state where you got the research, it's probably not good and you shouldn't use it. So that is all I have on um, creating the informative speech. I hope you found this really useful. Certainly lots of stuff in here to consider. And of course, the best way to learn it is to go practice. So go do that. Bye.